Good afternoon. My name is Brooks Jackson. I am Vice President for Medical Affairs at the University of Iowa, and I also serve as the Tyrone D. Arts Dean of the University of Iowa, Roy J. and Lucille A. Carver College of Medicine. I would like to formally welcome the class of 2023 and your families and friends, along with our faculty, staff, students, to the 25th annual White Coat Ceremony. This is always a wonderful occasion and fitting culmination of Orientation Week activities. Please join me in a round of applause to welcome our new class of first-year medical students. I would like to take this opportunity to recognize the deans, department chairs, and faculty who have joined us today. We are thankful for your strong support of the college and the class of 2023. Also here to help me welcome you today are several other esteemed colleagues. First, starting at my far right is today's keynote speaker, Dr. Kimberly Leslie. Dr. Leslie is professor, departmental executive officer, and the Jennifer R. Niebel Endowed Chair in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. <laughs> Next, we have Dr. Chris Cooper, Senior Associate Dean for Medical Education in the Carver College of Medicine and Professor in the Department of Urology. I think we heard them all today. I just thought. Next to Dr. Cooper is Dr. Patricia Winokur, Executive Dean and Senior Associate Dean for Clinical and Translational Science in the Carver College of Medicine. Dr. Winokur is also professor in the Department of Internal Medicine and it's in, in its Division of Infectious Diseases. Next is Dr. Mary Grace Elson, who is a clinical professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She is also currently serving as the 170th president of the Iowa Medical Society. And finally, it is my pleasure to introduce the University of Iowa Executive Vice President and Provost, Dr. Monse Fuentes. Dr. Fuentes joined the University of Iowa as Executive Vice President and Provost this summer, just a few weeks ago. She came to Iowa from Virginia Commonwealth University, where she served as Dean of the College of Humanities and Sciences, as well as Professor of Statistics in the college. She was also a faculty member in biostatistics at the VCU School of Medicine. Before joining Virginia Commonwealth in 2016, Dr. Fuentes was head of the Department of Statistics and the James M. Goodnight Distinguished Professor of Statistics at North Carolina State University in Raleigh. Prior to that, she served as Director of the Network on Statistical Methods in Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, a National Science Foundation funded center with 200 members and 21 affiliated institutions committed to promoting multi-institutional and interdisciplinary research training at the interface of statistics and atmospheric and oceanic sciences. Dr. Fuente's research interests include big data, brain imaging analysis, computer models, and interdisciplinary applications in the neurosciences, environmental sciences, and health sciences. In 2017, she was awarded the Medal of Distinguished Achievement from the American Statistical Association Environmental Statistics Section for major statistical methodology contributions, leadership, and mentoring roles. So we are proud to have her as a member of the University of Iowa community, and we are honored for her participation in today's white coat ceremony. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome UI Executive Vice President and Provost Monse Fuentes. Thank you, Dean Jackson. Distinguished colleagues, families, 
friends, and especially members of the Carver College of Medicine class of 2023. It is such a great pleasure to be with you on this very special day, and a privilege to be among the first to welcome you to the university of our community. There is so much excitement in the air at the start of a new academic year, and I certainly feel it here today in this room. It is the same for hundreds of other graduate and professional students who are also preparing to start a new chapter of their lives. Like you, those students are preparing to embark on a journey toward an ambitious academic and professional goal, to become our nation's future scientists and artists and educators and engineers. We are proud to welcome each one of them, and we are so excited for what their futures hold. But those students will not experience a ceremony like the one you are about to share in today. That's because the very special journey you are embarking on comes with a very special charge. Today, your faculty mentors will welcome you to, health, to the healthcare practice, one of the most important and most noble professional pursuits. As they do so, they will place on your shoulders a responsibility that includes the commitment to practice humanism in medicine, to keep human concerns always at the center of your professional life. The Arnold P. Gold Foundation describes a humanistic doctor as one who demonstrates compassion, altruism, respect, empathy, and service. In other words, one who truly cares, which is the acronym of those words. The humanistic doctor always remembers that a patient is a fellow huma human being. She considers how she would feel in the patient's shoes, and she's humbled by the trust the patient puts in her. The humanistic doctor recognizes that he learns from his patients every day and seeks to forge a compassionate connection with them based on honoring their dignity and emotional life. As you don the white coat today, I hope you will embrace its symbolism and from this moment forward, let it always remind you of the human bond that connects us and how powerful that bond can be. I hope that this moment today will help you to remember to, to nurture the special bonds in your personal life. Today, like every day, is really a great day to say thank you to the parents, grandparents, spouses, partners, children, and friends who have supported you through all the hard work that got you to this point today, and who will continue to cheer you on through the challenges and the triumphs ahead. And I hope that you will honor your own humanity by accepting your imperfections, staying true to who you are, and being kind to yourself as you face the inevitable ups and downs of the challenging path you have chosen. Doctors to be, I congratulate and honor you for the commitment you are making. I congratulate you also for choosing one of the very best colleges of medicine in the country with exceptionally high standards of excellence and one of the finest medical faculties in the nation. It is a place that is truly characterized by a strong spirit of collaboration among faculty and students, where you will make a difference in the lives of your peers, as well as your patients. It is a place where you have access to the extraordinary resources of a very comprehensive university, including wonderful arts and cultural opportunities that will enrich your life and your education. I encourage you to take full advantage of the wonderful opportunities you will find here, outside the walls of the Carver College of Medicine, as well as within. And finally, this is a place where we will challenge you because we believe in you and where we are committed to supporting you as you work to achieve your goals. We are here to help you be successful, and we will make sure you have the resources and the support that you need to reach your amazing potential. Know that along with your family and friends at home and here today, as a member of the Hawkeye family, you are surrounded by the most enthusiastic faculty, coaches, advisors, mentors, and cheerleaders. I thank you for being part of the great tradition that is healthcare and the health sciences at the University of Iowa. I know you are going to uphold the honor of that tradition in your practice, and I'm proud that you are going to help represent the University of Iowa to the world. 
It is my privilege to shake your hands today as you enter this new phase of your journey. On behalf of the entire University of Iowa community, congratulations, class of 2023. Welcome, and I wish you the very best in the wonderful years ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here today, and I appreciate all of the faculty, the students, the staff, the friends and family members that are here to share this important occasion. As Senior Associate Dean for Medical Education, it's my job to also help select the students who will attend the Carver College of Medicine. And I'm pleased to note that the class of 2023 is truly an exceptional group. As a graduate of this college, I speak from firsthand experience when I tell you that this is a great medical school. I can also tell you it's better now than it was then, but that's another story. <laughs> you will have excellent educational opportunities, both for your professional and your personal growth inside and outside of the classroom. One of the truly great things about Iowa is its people. And you will find that the Carver College of Medicine faculty and staff really care about your experience here and will be there for you throughout your medical education. There also is an unparalleled spirit of collaboration among students as well as faculty. That makes for an outstanding learning environment. I know that as the college's newest students, you will strengthen and carry on that tradition here and wherever you go. Now, it's my privilege to introduce the keynote speaker for the 2019 White Coat Ceremony, Dr. Kimberly Leslie. She is the Jennifer R. Nebel Endowed Chair in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Dr. Leslie earned a medical degree at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School. She received residency training in obstetrics and gynecology at Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas and at Georgetown University Affiliated Hospitals in Washington, D.C. She also completed a fellowship in maternal fetal medicine at Georgetown. Dr. Leslie has served as chair and departmental executive officer of the University of Iowa Department of OB-GYN, Obstetrics and Gynecology. I don't know if it's offensive to say OB-GYN, but you, you can let us know in a minute. Um, since 2009, she's been in that role. She came to Iowa from the University of New Mexico Health Science Center, where she was director of the Division of Maternal Fetal Medicine and chief of obstetrics in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Dr. Leslie's distinguished career epitomizes a commitment to academic medicine, and she is recognized across our campus as a consummate clinician, research investigator, and educator. In addition to her administration and leadership responsibilities as chair, Dr. Leslie is a devoted physician scientist, seeing patients in the clinics and leading advances in obstetrics research and discovery. Her research interests include fetal echocardiography, cancer and pregnancy, preeclampsia, and operative obstetrics. The current focus of her research, which is supported by the National Cancer Institute, is targeted therapy for endometrial cancer. Throughout her career, Dr. Leslie has also placed a high priority on teaching, training, and mentorship. Here at the Carver College of Medicine, she works with medical students, with OB-GYN residents, and maternal fetal medicine fellows in the high-risk obstetrics and fetal diagnosis and therapy clinics, as well as the labor and delivery unit. She also participates in the college's early clinical experiences shadowing program where first-year students are able to observe faculty and patient care settings. I can tell you, over the last five years at least, the OB-GYN clerkship has been rated by the medical students so highly that it is routinely and always has been over the last five years in the top 10th percentile uh, in the country. Now, I praise her for this, and she quickly deflects that praise and, and uh, highlights her faculty uh, and her residents that do this. But I can tell you, leadership matters, and a lot of it stems from the top. So she should be congratulated for those efforts. She's the recipient of numerous awards for her teaching and research, and she remains active in professional organizations at the national level. We are and I am delighted that she is here to deliver this year's keynote address so please join me in welcoming Dr. Kimberly Leslie.
Thank you, Chris. That's incredibly kind. Good afternoon, young physicians in training, family members, friends, and loved ones. It is indeed a great honor to have been tapped to provide your keynote address to the great class of 2023. My thanks for this opportunity goes to Deans Cooper, Winokur, and Jackson. It is truly a highlight of my career to share the stage with you as we address our medical students. Students, welcome to the land of the Hawkeyes. And we are Hawkeye doctors. Shall we say we are hawk docs? Okay, hawk docs. And you are our new hawklets. Hawklets, where did that come from? Well, I, I got that from eaglets, right? Uh, it's kind of like baby hawks. And so you guys are new to our flock of Iowa's soaring hawk docs, right? Your white coats will symbolize your developing hawk doc feathers. But the feathers have many names you will come to understand. Among these names are technical expertise, scientific knowledge, humanism, wisdom, humility, and service. And we, your faculty, will help you preen your feathers over the coming years. But before you get your coats, you have to hear about the Iowa line. And you may ask me, what is the Iowa line? What is it? Well, it's a symbolic creation our way of cataloging and remembering the many men and women who have contributed to the art and science of medicine. Not only do we wish to honor the Iowans in our lineage, but we must acknowledge the great discoveries and triumph of medicine through the ages that have informed our practice. So our Iowa line incorporates the ancient practitioners of medicine, as well as the physicians who have made a major impact on every hawk doc who's trained here. You, students, are now a part of the hawk Iowa line. Today it is my task to tell you a little bit about who has come before you. The beginning of our Iowa line is shrouded in the midst of prehistory really going back to the very early stages of the human race. So Hawk Docs, let's think in our minds, let's go back 70,000 years. Now, given the unexpectedly nearly identical DNA sequences of all modern humans, and in fact, we are 99.9% .9 identical at the level of the genome, amazing. So this has um, made some anthrop anthropologists speculate that we all arose from a modest number of early humans. Perhaps they were survivors of what may have been a natural disaster of epic proportions in prehistory. Some estimate that the population of early humans was thereby reduced to only a thousand breeding pairs. It's amazing, right? The survival of this ragtag group of early humans surely depended upon the skills and attention of individuals within the tribes, we will call them healers. And these healers could use even rudimentary tools to help others. And you know, early skeletons attest to this, right? So we see that bone healing occurred with the use of hardened mud cast. Um, and there were many other examples in the skeletons of attempts at medical care. Certainly, some were successful, many were not. Even so, I propose that these healers are our long distant forefathers in the art of medicine. And so they deserve mention in the Iowa line. We are soaring very high now in our minds and the millennia are passing rapidly. The survivors of this preclinical calamity and their progeny have populated the earth and the new civilizations are forming. The Egyptians, the Chinese, the Greeks, among the Greeks, Hippocrates, definitely a part of our line, and the Romans, and the great religious sects of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all had a major influence on the practice of medicine and thus our line. Indeed, the practitioners of Islamic medicine had the forethought to translate 
the writings and discoveries of the Greeks and Romans into Arabic, thereby preserving these for modern medicine while the Western world suffered through the Dark Ages. So went from Arabic to Latin and now handed down to us. But with the Renaissance, the science of medicine as we know it today was born and the Iowa line begins to glow more brightly. Our line was empowered by great physicians and scientists, including Andreas Vesalius. 1543, he published The Fabric of the Human Body. I hope you remember that because it is a masterpiece of scientific observation, the first true documentation of human anatomy. In 1628, William Harvey determined the correct circulation of blood to and from the heart and characterized the heart as a pump for the very first time. This was an inspired leap of understanding. And importantly, like Vesalius, Harvey published his observations, which is how we know him to be a master physician in our line today. And this reminds all hawk docs that it is absolutely critical that we publish our observations and discoveries. Other greats that populate our line include, for example, Edward Jenner, 1796, introduced the concept of vaccinating against smallpox for the first time. René Lanec, who invented the stethoscope, 1816. Ignaz Semmelweis, mid-1800s, very important in obstetrics. He determined that childbed fever, which was the major cause of maternal mortality in Vienna, was caused by the physician hands spreading disease. You can imagine what a controversial theory that was at the time. This was then followed by Louis Pasteur, who determined that there were such things as microorganisms to help explain some of Weiss's findings. And of course, the surgeons must pay homage to Joseph Lister, who was the first to promote antiseptic techniques of surgery. And of course, my personal favorite, James Simpson, head obstetrician at Edinburgh University, whose forceps we still use today on labor and delivery, believe it or not. He was also an advocate for anesthesia for women during childbirth, which was rare prior to his time. And he provided chloroform anesthesia to Queen Victoria during the birth of Prince Leopold, and this opened the door for other women to access anesthesia. Now in the late 1800s, we're gonna to come to Iowa. We are reaching the time of the beginnings of our medical school. The members of our first class took their training in a small medical building on the east side of the Iowa River starting in 1870. Of the 30 plus students, eight were women, thus establishing the University of Iowa as one of the first institutions to allow women to train as medical doctors. To honor this fact and her career, one of our learning communities is named for Dr. Jenny McCowan, who received her medical degree from the University of Iowa, 1876. Where are the McCowan community members? Please so signify your presence by clapping for Dr. McCowan. Indeed, your community is named for a great pioneer in the Iowa line. Nevertheless, it must be said, that medical education at the end of the 19th century, when our school was just established, was very fragmented and often considered to be of very poor quality. So in the early 1900s, at the request of physician leaders in the United States, the Carnegie Foundation engaged Abraham Flexner, PhD. He was an educator and he was an inspector and investigator. And his task was to review every medical school in the, in the US and to write a report about the status of each institution. Flexner came to the University of Iowa first in 1909. At that time, the college was housed in just a few little buildings on the north side of Iowa Avenue, and there was a 90-bed hospital, okay? Fifteen professors comprised the faculty. There are 1,300 faculty members today, so we've grown. Now, while Professor Flexner was complimentary of the inclusion of the basic sciences in the medical school curriculum, he was very passionate about that. His report reflected a major concern, that there were simply not enough patients in Iowa City 
to support a major medical school. He suggested that the medical school should be moved to a city with a larger population base, for example, Des Moines. But this would separate the medical school from the main university and was absolutely not acceptable to then UI President McLean. A very creative solution was found, and we can be very proud of this solution. The UI leadership appealed to the state legislature to pay for the care for the first time of poor individuals in Iowa, people who were called indigent patients. This happened and the university's hospital beds were suddenly full and had to build a brand new hospital to accommodate all these patients who heretofore could not have afforded to pay for medical care. And as you know, this hospital expanded and the institution has been one of the largest teaching institutions in the country for medicine. And yes, you may have surmised from this story that the state of Iowa created the first government-funded payer system, the forerunner of today's Medicare and Medicaid. I think that's pretty amazing. And from that time on, we've had plenty of patience, as we can all attest. Now, Flexner returned to Iowa again several years later, and he was amazed at the transformation of this medical school into one of the greatest in the country. He was so impressed with the state's um, pride in education that he agreed to serve on the Iowa Board of Education and was a consultant as the state grew its much broader and very renowned educational programs. Members of the now brightly glowing Iowa line that have made major contributions to medicine over the 150 years of our institution include so many. Their names that we could go on all day and Dr. Cooper would come give me the hook if I went too far, but I just have to say a few names. Dr. William Bean. Are there some beanies here? Go Beans. Dr. Lois Bolwer. Dr. Ruben Flux. And a few others I think we should say. Dr. Elmer DeGowan, who developed methods to store and to preserve blood, and you can imagine how many lives have been saved over the decades by Dr. DeGowan's discoveries. Uh, there was Dr. Braley in ophthalmology, who established the Eye Bank of America, that was 1962. Dr. Frank Abood, Chair Emeritus of Internal Medicine, Principal Investigator, of the longest running program project grant in the history of the NIH, Dr. Abood. <laughs> Doctors Kevin Campbell, Richard Smith, Michael Welsh, who are pioneers in genetics. And now Dr. Cooper wants me to stop talking, but I have one more to say. Dr. Brooks Jackson, very important for the field of obstetrics, performed the fundamental studies that demonstrated that it was possible to prevent the vertical transmission of HIV AIDS from mother to newborn at the time of delivery simply by giving antiretroviral therapies to pregnant women, something that had been withheld from them for decades before. But now it is your turn. It is your turn. With you, the Iowa line glows even brighter and will lengthen far into the future. Hocklets, you are our academic prodigy, and we are proud of you. Welcome to our college. Dr. Leslie, no, not, not so fast. For, for one, I, I would never have cut you off before you acknowledged my boss. Uh, so, uh, uh, That's true. But, but uh, it, your talk was terrific. I, I love, love the history. I love the, the uh, uh, delivery. Thank you. As a token of our gratitude and to commemorate your participation as keynote speaker today, I'd like to present you this clock engraved with, with your name on That's it. Lovely. So.
Now let's turn our attention to the white coat, a powerful symbol to both the medical profession and society at large. The way physicians dress has been an important part of medical practice since ancient times. In fact, Hippocrates, who now you know was an Iowan, uh, adv <laughs> advised doctors on how they should dress, saying, the healer's uniform should imply a professional interest and interaction. It must convey to even the most anxious patient or physician a seriousness of purpose that helps provide reassurance and confidence that medical concerns will be dealt with competently and conscientiously. Students, the white coat symbolizes your transformation to becoming a physician. It is a cloak of compassion and dedication toward your fellow human beings. May it also serve as a reminder of your commitment to your education and to your chosen profession. Today, we will introduce the students by membership in their learning community. The Carver College of Medicine learning communities are designed to allow students to support one another and provide more opportunities for leadership and service learning activities across all four years of medical school. The communities also help strengthen relationships between students and faculty, collegiate staff, and individuals in our local community. Each medical student has been randomly assigned to one of four learning communities. The faculty directors of each community will now introduce their students for the presentation of the white coats. We will begin with Dr. Michael Hogsdall and Paul Van Heuklem, who will represent the Bean Learning Community. As they read the names, Executive Dean Winokur and I will bestow the white coats, and VPMA and Dean Jackson, Provost Fuentes, Dr. Elson, and Dr. Leslie will offer their congratulations. Dr. Hogsdall and Van Hoekel. Thank you, Dean Cooper. Um, it is the privilege for Dr. Paul Van Hooklem and myself to represent the William Bean Learning Community today. The Bean Learning Community name pays tribute to a prominent physician whose legacy is still very evident in the Carver College of Medicine. Dr. William Bean served as the Carver College of Medicine's chairman of the Department of Internal Medicine from 1948 to 1971. <clears throat> and during that time, he built a great academic enterprise it encouraged excellence in patient care, in teaching, and in research. He was noted for boundless curiosity and a genuine love of learning. His leadership style encouraged and even inspired young faculty, quote, to greater heights of achievement than most dared to dream they would attain. This afternoon, it is our pleasure to introduce each of the new members of the William Bean Learning Community as they receive their white coat. Aperna Ajarapu. <clears throat> Riley Bean. Matthew Barons. Eric Bozart. Joseph Carmody. Karen Chen. Cassidy Dean. Anna Marie Dotzler. <laughs> Z. 
Zachary Flyshacker. Cheyenne Godwin. Anna Greenwood. Joseph Haight. Alexander Hart. Theodore Katz. Brian Kennard. Yanni Cornutus. Nicole Lacina. <clears throat> Tomas Lense. Corey Lynn. Hey, Jeff. How are you doing? <clears throat> Lucas Moxted. Nicholas Marino. <laughs> Jamie Miller. Sarah Minion. <laughs> Timothy Morris. <laughs> Ananya Munjal. Paige Noble. Samantha Parks.
Rebecca Peoples. Dayton Rand. Nathan Roby. Ryan Sabotin. <laughs> Olivia Snyder. Nathan Spitz. <laughs> Zenib Tunvir. Brittany Todd. Andy Tran. Abigail Walling. and Mimi Williams. And now it is my pleasure to invite Professor Katie Iverson and Dr. Ben Ranking to the podium to introduce the students from the Bullware Learning Community. Our community is named for Dr. Lois Bulware, who was one of the only six women graduates in the class of 1937. After a long career as the assistant director of the university's, university's student health service, she found herself compelled to help improve patient-physician communications and establish the nation's first hospital patient advocacy program. Then after her second attempt to retire, Dr. Bulwer found a new mission to create space for family members of patients undergoing surgery. Thus opened the Day of Surgery Lounge, which now bears her name, with staff able to provide information regarding surgery specifics and to relay updates from the operating room. Our community prides itself in carrying on her tradition of a lifetime devoted to the delivery of compassionate, excellent health care with a human touch. It is my great honor to welcome and present to you the newest members of the Lois Bulwer Learning Community of the Carver College of Medicine. All right, Emily, here we go. Emily Anderson. Brandon Bacalzo. Nathan Behrens. <laughs> Connor Burke Smith.
Catherine Shampoo. Amanda Chang. Allison Cunningham. Emerald Dolman. <laughs> Catherine Fadley. Bradley Fleming. Massachusetts. Corey Ford. Brian Fu. Clara Garcia. Zachary Grossman. <laughs> Yi Fan He. Day Kwong. Matthew Kelly. Andy Lawrence. Gage Lydiard. Madeline Lorenzen. Mackenzie McKnight. Joseph Mueller. Oh, 
We Samna Shawi. Nicholas Sahoyas. Ryan Reese. Sophia Rotman. Oscar Salas. Nicholas Son. Sienna Schaefer. Zachary Skopak. <laughs> Haley Stephan. Sarah Stevie. How's it going, Sarah? <laughs> Samantha Swartz. Ashley Vaughn. Ashley, congratulations. Madison Walleen. Ryan Ward. <laughs> Kirk Welsh. Jennifer Wu. I would now like to introduce Dr. David Swanson and Dr. Catherine DeGeter, who will introduce the Flox Learning Community.
Reuben Flox started his urology residency in 1931 at the University of Iowa Hospitals. He stayed on as faculty and quickly rose to the urology department chair in 1949 and held that position for a quarter century. He was a recognized world leader in research of bladder and prostate cancer. He was an early adopter of nuclear medicine and published dozens of papers on brachytherapy using radioactive gold. Dr. Flox was an incredibly dedicated physician. There's a lot of stories about that, but we won't go there today. His work ethic was legendary. Exemplary patient service was, a very, was very important to him. He not only led the department, but held many leadership positions at the state and national level, including president of the Iowa Medical Society, American Board of Urology, and the American Urologic Association. The UIHC clinic is named the Reuben Flox Urology Clinic in his honor. So interestingly, I took care of a patient who had been a patient of Dr. Flox. I took care of him last month. Dr. Flox had taken care of this patient about 60 years ago when he was a child. The, the patient was pretty darn excited to hear that uh, I had this connection with Flox and uh, went on to tell me that Flox was his favorite doctor of all times. It was, that, that impressed me, you know, 70 years, and Reuben Flox was his favorite doctor. So some of the things he said, he remembered in particular, uh, he had several surgeries with Dr. Flox, one of which was an emergency surgery, and he was amazed how quick Dr. Flox just like appeared as he's getting wheeled down the hall. And not only that, he was holding his hand as he was wheeled into the operating room. He was amazed how comforting that was to have Dr. Flox right there, and he just felt at ease once uh, Dr. Flox showed up and, and was there. And I, I just think that's amazing. The, the other thing he said uh, was that Dr. Flox was always smiling. I don't think that was the case so much with his trainees, but uh, <laughs> with patients, he always uh, had a smile, according to this patient, and, and he just found that to be such a comfort, and I, I think a great example of, of compassion that uh, can be a challenge for all of us, and I think Dr. Flox made a great example of that. So on behalf of Dr. Jajeter and myself, I'm very honored to introduce the next class of the Flox Learning Community, Sahana Arumagam. <laughs> Greta Becker. Claire Burns Leone. Thomas Kassir. Elvis Castro. Kevin Chang. Elena Chen. Jack Curran. <laughs> Jeffrey Dobrzynski. Jordan Eisenman. Jordan, how are you doing? Good. 
Jonah Elif. Michael Garneau. Anna Grief. Joshua Hagerdorn. Christopher Halburn. Good name. Good name. <laughs> Sally Heberlin. Marguerite Jakubiak. Alec James. Allison Jasper. <laughs> Jacob Kaplan. Morgan Kennedy. Hey, Morgan. How are you doing? <laughs> Faison Kawaja. Kayla Cruz. Caitlin Madison. Jacob McClinton. Jacob, how's it going? <laughs> Matthew McElrath. Catalina Mulinax. Pooja Patel.
Nikitha Putharedi. Lulua Roas. <laughs> Emily Ruba. Eli Schmidt. <laughs> Christina Sevchik. Sarah Silverman. Sarah, how's it going? <laughs> Xavier Tijadina. Victoria Vivtrinko. Cody West. Robert Zhu. It is now my pleasure to introduce for the McCowan Learning Community, Dr. Terry Thompson and A.J. Patel. The McCowan Learning Community is named after Dr. Jeannie McCowan, as you heard earlier. Um, Dr. McCowan, as you also heard from Dr. Leslie, was among the first women to enroll in and graduate from the University of Iowa Medical Department, as it was known in the 1870s. She attended medical school at a time when many medical schools did not even accept women and received her MD in 1876. She was widely respected and active leader in state and national professional organizations and was a founder of the Iowa State Society of Medical Women. In addition, she promoted numerous projects supporting women, children, and institutionalized patients. The McCowan community continues this commitment to community service with support of the mission of the Domestic Violence Intervention Project, or sorry, program, and among other projects. I'd like to have you join me in welcoming the newest members of the McCowan Learning Community. Mohad Awan. Kaylee Barnett. Madeline Beauchene. <laughs> Jared Blade. Tyler 
Tyler Bolte. Ty Bolte. Joshua Borwick. Peter Brennan. Claire Carmichael. Jessica Dahan. Jordan Harzma. Elaine Harrington. Mustafa Hashmi. Ryan Havy. Tim and Higgins. Anna Kaljan. Kenton Kingsbury. Camilla Kazara. Ethan Lemke. Miriam Monser. Michael Mariner. Nolan Mattingly. Ethan Myberg.
Bryn Myers. Bryn, how are you doing? Milos Pavic. Katie Pham. Stephanie Say. <laughs> Alexa Schmitz. Leslie Shu, <laughs> Eric Solis. Talia Saab. <laughs> Hannah Steenblock. Logan Steens. Logan, you're welcome. Aaron Sullivan. Rosary Tudis. Angeline Van Lee. Ellen Voigt. Welcome, Ellen. Anna Wilcox. Anthony Zhang. Okay, 
There is perhaps no greater social duty than the one a physician accepts. Physicians hold a unique knowledge that requires years of patient study and a constant desire for continued education. Class of 2023, when you decided to become a physician, you made a promise to practice the art and science of medicine faithfully and truthfully. You have agreed to accept the duty of helping your fellow human beings. This is not a promise to be taken lightly. Whether we make a difference one patient at a time or through research and discovery that will help scores of people, we must always remember that promise. The Hippocratic Oath, named for Hippocrates, the ancient Greek physician and father of modern medicine, was created to emphasize the promise you have made. Our college has been celebrating this oath since our first white coat ceremony in 1995. To our students, I urge you to think about the true meaning of this oath as you join me in making this pledge. Students, please now stand and join me in reciting the Hippocratic Oath. I do solemnly swear by that which I hold most sacred that I will be loyal to the profession of medicine and just and generous to all, that I will lead my life and practice my art in uprightness and honor, that into whoever else I shall enter, it shall be for the good of the sick to the utmost of my power. I, holding myself aloof from wrong, from corruption, and from the temptation of others to vice, that I will exercise my art solely for the cure of my patients and will give no drug, perform no operation for a criminal purpose, even if solicited, and far less suggest such a thing. That whatsoever I shall see or hear of the lives of others which is not fitting to be spoken, I will keep inviolably secret. These things I do promise, and in proportion as I am faithful to this, my oath, May happiness and good repute be ever mine, the opposite if I shall be forsworn. Students, please be seated. This concludes the formal portion of the ceremony. We ask students to gather on the grand staircase outside the auditorium for a class picture. We ask family and friends to please remain in their seats until the recessional has finished. A reception will follow up in the Stanley Cafe and down in the Smith Lobby. So thank you so much for joining us today. Have a good afternoon and a pleasant weekend. Thank you. Thank you.